Um, thank you very much for having me, and I'm very honoured to be asked to do the, the Guardian's address this year. Um, my father-in-law, who's American, was saying to me, you know, how can you go and do all these speeches in front of crowds of people? Do, you're not afraid, or, you know, you're not terrified? And I went, well, the very worst that can happen is that you forget what you're going to say, and then you're just left in front of loads and loads of people talking rubbish. And that just means you know what it feels like to be Murdo Fraser. <laughs> <laughs> and he didn't get the reference, obviously. But we're here to honour a guardian of Scotland, a great hero of Scottish history. But to be honest, what we're facing today is not about the history of Scotland, it's about the future of Scotland. And that's what we're all focusing on. We're focusing on where this country's going and not where this country has been. And we had a great guardian of Scotland in the form of William Wallace. But today Scotland has changed, Scotland's a democracy. We have hundreds and thousands of guardians in Scotland. And we don't use swords, we don't use arrows, we don't fight with weapons. We fight with words, and we fight with persuasion, and we fight with arguments, and we fight with persuasion, and we fight with love. And the reason that we're here today is because all of us share a vision of a better Scotland that's within our grasp. And that's what we're aiming for. And the, 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 the opposition that we're facing is, is negativity and fear. And the scare stories that we all have to face and the scare stories that we have to challenge. And the thing that's changed between now and 2014 is that back in 2014, the opponents of independence were able to say, oh, but Scotland, we love you. Scotland, you'll be an equal partner in a family of nations. Here's a vow, here's a promise, here's all the things that we can give you. And I've been racking my brains and trying to think of any of the promises and commitments that the Better Together campaign made to Scotland in 2014 that they actually kept. And the only one I can think of is that Michelle Moan said she was going to leave the country. <laughs> <laughs> Which... To give them credit for us in our bag. But that's why we are where we are today. Because of the failure of the British state and the Westminster establishment to keep the promises that it made to the people of Scotland. And we hear an awful lot about how, oh, you've got to respect the result of the referendum. Well, we do respect the result of the referendum because we haven't actually declared the independence yet. You may not have noticed. But it's far more important that the people who respect the result of a referendum are the people who won it. And that they should be held to account for the promises and commitments that they made in order to win that vote. Because if we can't hold them to account for that, then democracy is dead. And that's why Scotland needs its hundreds and thousands of guardians. Because we have to make sure that those people are held to account that the promises and commitments that they made to the Scottish people are honoured. And that's why we're all here today. And all that I've got left now are the scare stories and threats and the intimidation and the bullying. And we're going to be hearing a lot of that in the months and weeks to come. And all they've got, the biggest story we have got is that we're too poor, that we can't afford it, we can't afford to become independent. And we get that every year in the jail statistics that come out to tell us just how rubbish Scotland really is. And I don't understand that. I don't get why they think that's such a fantastic argument in their favour. Because it's not. Because for a start, I mean, I don't believe it. But even if it was true, even if it really was true, that Scotland was reduced to penury because of 300 years of Westminster rule, that's hardly a good argument for retaining Westminster rule. Because when you think about it, this country is blessed with incredible advantages that most countries can only dream of. We have got an abundance of energy resources in this country. We have got 300 years worth of coal, which we're keeping in the ground because it's bad for the planet. We've got oil and gas coming out of the Wazoo in the North Sea. And it's been, probably it's been running out since the 1970s, and it's not run out yet. <laughs> But we have got so much in the way of conventional energy services in this country that we can afford to have a national conversation about fracking and decide that we don't want it because it's bad for the environment. And most countries that have fracking resources can't afford to have that conversation because they don't have other options. Scotland does. 
and Scotland had just starting to come on stream. Just in the first six months of this year, twice as much electricity as Scotland's domestic consumption, twice as much electricity as we need, was produced by wind energy alone in Scotland. Scotland has got one quarter of the entire renewable, the entire wind energy potential for the whole of Europe. That's an incredible resource that this country has got. We have got one quarter of the entire wave and tidal energy resources of the whole of Europe. And that's a technology that's only just starting to be developed. And it will last forever. It will last as long as the moon goes round the earth. And it will create the tides. And that will produce energy that can be tapped into and produced for the people of Scotland that we can export. Scotland is in the enviable position of being a net exporter of energy. And energy is the raw material, the fuel of any economy, and Scotland possesses it in abundance. We've got other advantages. Scotland exports four billion pounds a year in food and drink. We are in, more or less, in balance with our food exports and our food imports. And that's a very enviable position for countries to be in. England and Wales, they import over 45% of their food and drink is imported from elsewhere. They're dependent on external sources for that. Scotland isn't. Scotland has got an abundance of arable land. Scotland has got a games industry that's worth a billion pounds a year. Glasgow is the largest producer of microsatellites in the entire world, which means that Glasgow is actually the world capital for space cadets. <laughs> Speaking as a Glaswegian, I'm quite proud of that. <laughs> but the advantages that this country has don't end there. That's Scotland has got, I lived in Spain for 15 years, and the local government, the regional government, had to spend millions of pounds building a desalination plant in order to make sure that there was enough fresh water for people to drink. That's just something that doesn't happen in Scotland. In Scotland, there's a theory in linguistics, it's called the sapir roth hypothesis, which says that your language shapes your view of the world. And in the Scots language, when you say, I hear druth, it doesn't mean I want a drink of water. It means I want a drink of alcohol. Because the concept of not having enough water just doesn't occur to Scottish people. It falls out the sky in massive, massive quantities. And we just take that for granted, man. We complain about it. We complain about the amount of food, yeah? We complain about the amount of water and the amount of rain that we get. But it's actually a blessing. Scotland will never no drought. And that's a resource that most countries would, can only envy. And yet, with the advantages and benefits of Scotland, there's actually an American historian who wrote a book called Scotland Invented the Modern World, How Scots Invented the Modern World, and it detailed all the contributions that this country of five million people have made to the planet. And it's on a global, a truly global scale. Scotland has a world-beating record for invention, for innovation, and for research, and for academic, uh, academic studies. This country has got four of the top universities in the world's 100. We're an English-speaking, highly educated population, even those of us who come from Glasgow. A higher proportion of Scottish people have got further educational qualifications of almost any other country in Europe. This country really is truly blessed. And yet, the advantages that we've got don't stop there. I lived in Spain, like I said, for 15 years, and in Spain, the Scottish independence debate was constantly being held up as a shining example to the Basques and the Catalans of how debates like this should really be conducted. Scotland was able to have an independence referendum, and it's still talking about independence to this day, and we were able to do so with good humour and peacefully and with great respect for democracy. Most countries in the world, when people talk about independence, that's an argument, that's a debate that's had with bullets and bombs and states of emergency and internment camps. In Scotland, the only casualty of the independence movement during the independence campaign of 2014 was Jim Murphy's dry cleaning bill. <laughs> and that is an enormous testament 
to the democratic goodwill of everybody in Scotland. And when it becomes an independent country, and it will become an independent country, will be one of the strongest democracies in the world. Because we have a huge respect for democratic traditions and allowing people to voice their opinions in this country. And yet, Scotland is also um, is blessed with being in a quiet and peaceful geopolitical part of the globe. We don't want to invade anybody. No one wants to invade us. There is no other block of people anywhere else in the world who long to be reunited with the Scottish homeland. We have no territorial claims on anybody. I've been to Berwick. It's a nice town, but they can keep it. So Scotland will be peaceful. We will enjoy peace. In the 300 odd years since we've been a part of the United Kingdom, only 60 years has the United Kingdom not been at war with anybody. Hasn't been involved in some sort of military action. That's quite a shameful record when you think about it. I want an independent Scotland because an independent Scotland can be a country of peace. It can be an example of peace to the rest of the world. So when our anti-independence friends tell us that Scotland's an economic basket case, it's dependent on handouts from the United Kingdom, which makes you kind of wonder, by the way, that Scotland must be the only only place in the world that conservatives throw huge quantities of money at out of sheer altruism and nothing else, because those are people that won't even pay for a spare bedroom, never mind an extra whole country. So when they tell us that, my argument is, well, what they have done then is they've taken what is, can only be a recipe for the world's most prosperous, stable, democratic country and they've turned it into a complete and utter basket case if what you say is true. And if what you say is true, that's not an argument against Scottish independence. That's an argument that Scotland ought to run away from Westminster rule as fast as our hairy little Caledonian legs can carry us. And I am more convinced than ever that that's going to be happening sometime soon. All the way through the first independence referendum, and I love seeing the first independence referendum because there's going to be another, and the next Scottish independence referendum will be the last Scottish independence referendum because we're going to win it and we won't need another. And all the way through the first, I had always had a wee voice in the back of my head going, ah, oh, no, I don't think we can do this, I don't think we can. And that voice is still now. Because I am convinced that when we have another vote, and we will have another vote, Scotland will take the decision to rejoin the family of independent nations. And Scotland will, once again, take its rightful place in Europe and its rightful place in the world, and we can do what we've always proud. So thank you all very much for listening.